Yeah. <laughs> Ordered Phil, check us out. I you know what time it is. This is Mighty Soldiers exclusive. Yeah. Let's get it. Let's get it. How you guys doing? I'm Andy with Mighty Soldiers Trades. Today we have a very special guest, Rachel Carpenter, the CEO of Intrinio is on with us. And uh, today, guys, we're going to be talking about uh, the data behind your trades and a little bit about motivation and the role of discipline in staying motivated. So I'm going to bring Rachel on. Hi, Rachel. Good morning. Hey, how's it going? Things are great here. We just moved down to Florida like last October. And welcome. I, I feel <laughs> like it's an endless vacation every single day. So I'm loving we, it. We, we do get to work in paradise. <laughs> it really is. It, it's it's amazing. And, you know, well, the only thing for us, we were walking a trail one time. We looked back and there was three pileated woodpeckers on the palm trees. I love pileated <laughs> woodpeckers, but I've never seen on a, on a palm tree before. Uh, we didn't know yeah. that. There was, was that? I was, was going to say, you got to say that 10 times fast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There was but there was there was a five to six foot gator right at our feet about a foot and a half away. And we didn't even know he was there until he popped his head up. And it's like, oh, OK, that was yeah. that was fun. I want to start with um, for me, entrepreneurship started as a child. My grandpa, he went to the flea market all the time. So I was over there like trying to talk to the baseball card dealers and, you know, getting their really rough personality. They didn't. Yeah. They didn't treat us well as kids. They they <laughs> you know, they treated us just like anybody else. So when we're trying to negotiate. They, yeah. they were not nice. And, uh, you know, I used to push a lawnmower around the trailer park where I grew up. And just nice. that's what I did every single day. I even tried to, you know, wash cars, uh, walk dogs, you know, anything I could do. Did this all start for you as a child? And just how? Did oh, you my God. It? Oh, yeah. Uh, so my brother actually works with me. He's my chief operating officer. And we were just hooligans together growing up. I mean, we would like we literally if you can picture it, I played the bassoon in band. He played the tuba and we would sit on the side of the road playing a bassoon and a tuba, like horrible, right? With like just trying to earn money. We would go to events downtown and try to sell sodas to people to try to make some extra bucks like around different events that were going on. We were always into something. And the irony is that, you know, 10 years later, after we both graduated from college, we're entrepreneurs again together in a real way this time. though. So, yeah, absolutely. I think for a lot of people, it starts starts pretty young like that. That's so awesome that you get to work with your brother. Um that brings me to a story. Uh, when I was a kid, me and my brother, we we went uh, Christmas caroling. And I don't know if we intentionally wanted to make money Christmas caroling or not. But all of a sudden, people started coming out with lots of lots of money. I mean, we we made more money Christmas caroling in one night than we made mowing lawns in the whole month. You know, it sounds so like you was, should have had an even different career path. You should have been a singer if they were paying you like that. <laughs> I was a little kid. It was all about the cute factor at that point. You know, mm. I, I don't I don't think it would work out quite as well. I do sing in the stream sometimes when we're trading live and, uh, you know, I, I, I get laughed at. So it, it works. <laughs> it's all good. But yeah. Um, so one thing I wanted to ask you, too, you, I, I saw on your Instagram is really motivational. You, you seem to live a really active life. You get out there and you challenge yourself. You push your, yeah. I, I would assume that you push yourself to do things that you're afraid of doing. And when I joined yeah. the army, I had to join airborne. It had to be in my contract. You know, mm. I had to push myself in a place that I was not, uh, probably willing to go otherwise. Yeah. And everything in life for me has been, it's been a lot more fun based on that, you know? So like the, the more that I push myself into something I don't want to do, the, the more amazing life has been. So is there something that, that, Basically, is that what you do to keep motivated and 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 be able to? Because, you know, you know, motivation wanes, and yeah. discipline is 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 uh, discipline stays strong as long as we yeah. stick to that. But is yeah. is that like a main thing that keeps you going? To the extreme, yes. <laughs> I my whole life have been like this. I absolutely. I, every year, I pick a couple of things that just scare the absolute living hell out of me and make sure that I do them. Um, things that are uncomfortable, things that I'm just literally terrified of. Um, so, you know, even scuba diving scared me. I'm a little afraid of going under the water, forced myself to get scuba certified. It was terrifying. I had free panic attacks, but I did it. And now I'm certified. Right. And so things like that, challenges like that. And the active side is, is pretty huge for me. I mean, I was an athlete in college and I naturally love being outside, love being active. Um, but like, I think anybody who says they're not afraid of heights is just absolutely shitting you, right? Like everyone's afraid of heights. It's not like it's not scary to be up there, but rock climbing, canyoneering, which I tried for the first time um, this year, which was absolutely terrifying, um, stuff like that. Um, and then it's always kind of like, like my friends right now are in a stage where they're asking me, what's your next thing, Rachel? 
like, what's your, ne- your, your, what's your next thing that you're going to do? And it's, I'm like, shit, is it time again? Like, I got to go do something, try something crazy again. Um, but, you know, I did a bodybuilding competition once, which I will never do again. Just pure aesthetics and no sport. But for me, it was like a mental challenge. I literally just wanted to see how low I could get my body fat percentage and see if I had the mental fortitude to do it, which to most people might sound crazy. But I did it once and I'll never have to do it again. Um, so things like that, right? Like I did a bodybuilding competition, checked that off the list. My brother encouraged me to get into jujitsu, um, which like for a woman, right? Like you're rolling around on a mat, like with your thighs locked around a dude's head, like sweating, right? Like it's disgusting. And in theory, it's kind of terrifying. Like these dudes are bigger than you and you're trying to learn how to use leverage as a smaller person to fight against them, right? It's like the average person that's terrifying. But to me, I really forced myself just to go. Sadly, um, it was right before COVID. So I got a year of training under my belt and all the gyms shut down. And to your point about discipline, I haven't gone back yet. So, but that was just kind of another challenge in the book was, you know, our body is our last line of defense. It's a weapon. We should know how to use it. And so um, even, especially for women it was self-defense. So from outdoor canyoneering to bodybuilding, to jujitsu, to all of it, there's just, I don't like to be bored. Right. And I do like to challenge myself because it kind of, to your point, it keeps you in that state of, heightened awareness and and just the ability to kind of act and uh keeps you alive reminds you that you're alive <laughs> yes it's uh, you know kind of like uh be be aware of your surroundings and stuff it's you're more able to be aware of your surroundings if you're putting yourself in unusual surroundings you know yeah. if, you, if you're in circumstances where you know anything can happen and you're not used to that thing i think it really helps yeah. me i got hurt in the army a long time ago and uh, this was a major uphill battle for me there was a point when i had a uh, ice pack on my head, TENS unit on, and a heating pad all at the same time, you know, with oh, yeah. pills that just did not work. And and just pushing myself and getting outside to walk a trail, that was the beginning. And it's like, wow, I feel so much more alive just doing this, just being able to get yeah. out here. So I started doing that every day and then more and more pushing myself until I get back into life. I already told right. you that doing this whole live thing, you know, that was not something I saw myself doing. But, yeah. you know, Benzinga invited me to come over there on live and it was like, yeah, I'll share whatever I know. I, I want to help people, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. And I see you you put out a lot of awesome YouTube videos helping um, potential fintech companies that might want to get in this space. Is there anything that you'd want to touch on about that? Like if, there, if we have somebody that's out there creating an app, creating, a, you know, some sort of website that that might really be looking for data, unusual options, mm-hmm. what, what do you guys have? What is in, what is in Trinio and what can you bring to the retail community? Yeah, great question. So, um, is it okay if I tell you a little bit of a story about how we got started? Because it might, Please it do. might, yeah. it might like help explain why we're here and what we're doing in the first place. <laughs> um, so in college, I studied uh, finance and entrepreneurship, met my co-founder. He was finance and accounting, lots of financial and accounting background. Um, and originally what we were trying to build was an app for the everyday investor where you could just type in a ticker. And it was kind of a, I know I'm talking to a bunch of traders right now, but it was kind of like a Benjamin Graham, Warren Buffett value investing style approach where you could type in a ticker and instantly get an intrinsic value of the stock with a margin of safety around it. And so you could pull slider bars and adjust things like no pet margin, invested capital turnover, revenue growth, cost of capital assumptions, slider bars, click, instant value of the stock, undervalued, overvalued, strong buy, strong sell. This didn't exist. This was like almost a decade ago now. And so apps and like automated tools like this didn't exist. And so our vision in the beginning was actually to build our own app, which has not what we're doing today, <laughs> but because the whole thing went up in flames and that's why we started in Trinio. So what we, we quickly realized was that to do any type of analysis like that requires massive amounts of data behind the scenes. And we didn't know, we knew a lot about investing and finance and we both taught ourselves how to program, which was an absolute nightmare, but we did it um, and got the app built, right? But there's so much data in the background. I mean, we were screen scraping from thousands of websites illegally (laughs) just to get the data we needed, right? Because at the time we didn't realize like the lifeblood of all these trades of everything that's happening is data, right? Like it's the blood that runs through the investment system. And if you don't have good access to it, it's not available, no, nothing happens, right? You can't innovate, you can't build, you can't trade, you can't you know, start a hedge fund, you can't build an app, you can't do anything. Um, and so we called all the big traditional data vendors like the Bloombergs of the world and got quoted $80,000 a month 
for the data because we had a read what is called a redistribution use case. And I promise you this relates to retail investors. <laughs> um, so if you're just buying data from these guys and crunching it internally, they're not that afraid of you, right? Like you're just using the data internally for your own analysis. If you're buying the data and displaying it or redistributing it inside of an app where other users are gonna look at it, they're really fucking scared of you because you might use that data to build a better tool than they have, right? And so you can cannibalize some of their, their products like the terminals and the workstations that a lot of investors use. And so we were the ones they were afraid of. We were really motivated FinTech engineers who wanted to build apps for investors. And they, that's why they slapped all those redistribution fees. They really don't like the data to get out and get displayed anywhere. And if it is, you have millions and millions of dollars of, of redistribution fees, right? And so you can think about like, what do retail traders need, right? Like they need tools. They, they're not gonna be able to subscribe to a Bloomberg terminal, right? They need, they need to be able to see the data in front of them. They need charts, they need analytics, they need tools, they need easy ways to execute trades. This all lives in kind of like this app ecosystem level, right? Where you're, you need people building those tools for you in order to give you access to the markets. But the people building those tools a level below need data to begin with, right? And so essentially what we realized was we can't afford to put gas in our own car. We just spent a year of our lives building an app and it's just sitting in the driveway and we can't put gas inside of it. Like the pure fury is hard to describe, right? Like an entire year of my life. What did I just learn how to program for? Like we were pissed and sometimes if directed correctly, that can be a huge motivator, right? Right, yeah. The wrong direction, it can be really bad, right? But we were angry enough to figure out a way to start building a business that unlocked a lot of that data, specifically with the mission of getting it in the hands of the people that are building the tools that the retail traders and the, the you know retail investment community is using. So we're kind of like a layer beneath, right? Like the apps and the tools that you're used to using wouldn't be here if we hadn't unlocked the data to make it available to the innovators to build those apps. And so that is the most fun part about the job is that we get to see our data come alive inside of like AI trading bots and options investment platforms and you know brokerage APIs and different different things like that. So we we are in a fun position to be on the forefront of all of the tools that are getting built in fintech, and a lot yeah. of them are, are retail trading tools. Yeah, that's that's one thing um, I was going to bring up today. Uh, a big thing for me is is I think that the world is too too ready to say no, too ready to look for the nose, to find the exit, to find the way out. And I always believe in looking for the yeses, you know? Um, I won't accept anything less within myself to, I just can't quit. I, if, I, if I get my sights on something, it's, it's something that I have to continue to go for, even when everybody else is saying it's impossible. It, it's just, and I, I don't know, I'm just almost like I have this drive that I can't even get in the way of myself. And it's amazing, yeah. but you know, what you were saying there, that just, that just brings that to mind. And um, I wanted to ask you though, well, before we get into this, can you tell us any of the, the the retail trading companies that you work with? I know TT Black Box, I think that's one of them, right? Yeah, um, Transparent Traders, Era, Olive Invest, um, Stocks. <laughs> um, we have a lot of really fun clients in this space. Uh, if you go to our website, you can see them all listed too. But we also power data into like Robinhood, FTX. Um, there's another really a new one that came out called D Domain Money, which is a former Goldman Sachs team. So lots of really interesting apps. Tons in the options trading space. So for your options traders, um, that's been, I mean, over the past two years, the fastest growing segment of apps that we've seen come out in the option space. I mean, obviously GameStop, Reddit, right? <laughs> little, little bit of a catalyst there. <laughs> Is there any, any particular story of a company that you've worked with that you had a lot of fun or extra challenges with that you might want to share? Oh my goodness. There's been so many. I mean, we like the interesting thing about our model is that like, we've literally been in the shoes of our customers, right? Like we literally tried to build an app and couldn't afford the data. So we have this like mama bear approach almost, right? Where it's like, we're only successful if you're successful. If we don't just integrate the data and then good luck, right? Because if you if your startup fails, then we fail right alongside you, right? And so it really is this, like it sounds hokey, but it is this like family approach to it where it's like, the more our clients apps grow and scale and get users, like the better the ecosystem is. And so there's this like, strong sense of community and sharing and you know tips and tricks and best practices and co co-marketing and co-promotion right like the best way for us to promote our clients or to get new clients is to give people examples 
of how the data is being used, right? So we have our own podcast that we put out called FinTech, what the heck, <laughs> that my brother runs, um, and tons of uh, promotions and blogs and use cases and studies. But yeah, we have a handful of, of customers that we've been with since since the beginning, right? Well, I mean, one is called Zigma, um, a super interesting AI kind of retail trading platform. Um, and he's over in Europe, but like, you know, we share investors, we share like operational strategies, we share talent, like we help each other fundraise. Like it's really kind of an open community, which means I spend a lot of time working with customers as a CEO because I get where they've been and I've been in their shoes. And so I know a lot of the CEOs personally of these apps that are being powered by our data. So I love it. It's, it's not that scalable. I can't do it with every single customer we have, but, um, but we try to help out as much as we can. And it's a lot of fun. That is an amazing approach. I like, you know, how you work together and, and you, you, I mean, I, I was going to bring this up too. Um, I, I see a lot of companies that, well, I see two different ways. I see there's either closing doors to competition, you know, and worrying about competition and even putting energy into uh, worrying about that competition. And I see that more as like a, a jealous boyfriend or girlfriend that is never going to be the approach that I want in my life. It just doesn't seem healthy or, or happy for me, you yeah, know, and, yeah. And on the on the flip side of that, I believe a rising tide lifts all ships. You know, like like you've heard time and time again. It's it's I don't understand when somebody you know starts calling you competition when you can work together and you can better each other and and you right. can lift this whole community. So I'm yeah. here for the community. That's that's my whole Absolutely. thing. Like I I believe if you have something to provide in the trading community and you want to come over here and you think you're a direct competitor to us, no matter what we're doing at that time, you know, I'm more than willing to bring you in. I had a friend, uh, Mac, he was an 87 year old guy. He was in the ceramics business. And what he did was he created this new assembly line. This is a long time ago for, yeah, for this yeah. whole business. And he, when he, he created this for himself, but then he called and reached out to his competitor. Not only did he go and build it for him. I mean, he put it together, he gave it to him. He didn't sell it. He helped his whole entire business without, you know, without trying to, to sell it, without trying to be better and destroy his competitors or anything. He just went and did yeah, that. Yeah. And as a result, he started getting more calls from that other guy's contacts and then their contacts. And his his world just got so much bigger because he went and he gave something that otherwise he wouldn't do. Yeah. I love the jealous boyfriend analogy. And a rising tide lifts all ships. Might steal that from you in our marketing. That's a pretty good one. I like that. Yeah, I mean, it's just really, it's really important for us to all understand this community is not, it's, 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 it's actually a small community. You know, there's a lot of people here, but, you know, we need to be here for each other. And it's just so cool that we can learn together and, and share this stuff without trying to, you know, yeah, get in each yeah. other's way to do it. But, um, yeah, so Rising Tide Lives All Ships. I like the jealous thing. It, that's how it hit me. It was like, <laughs> yeah. why, why in the world do we want to uh, create all this negative energy stopping and closing doors? Because when you're closing doors off to one thing, you're not opening up yourself to the things that you need to be focused on. I, I, I put my hashtag all the time forward and up because that's the yep, only way yep. I can go. I don't need to look over here and over there and worry about what they're doing. I can only go one direction and take each step. But um, so you always talked about the data and the companies that you've worked with, but you, you touched on the data and how you can get fines if you are sharing real time data without knowing what you're doing. Whew, yeah, this is a big one. We do a ton of videos around this, right? Like, cause we've seen it all like, and if you're an investor or a trader or building an app for an investor or a trader across the board, right? Like it's not your job to know all these details. Like you're not a data expert, right? Like you should be worrying and focusing on what you're good at, which is the trades or the app or whatever. Like, so we, we do like, I understand why people make these mistakes, right? And so we do everything we can. Like I have a whole video series called Market Data 101 highly recommend because like the amount of regulation and like part of my French, but like fucked up regulation around all the exchanges is insanity. Like after the Dodd-Frank act got passed, it's literally set up such that stock exchanges can literally charge whatever they want with no repercussions. So essentially like they file with the sec for the ability to charge more exchange fees and more per user fees and more display fees. And the second they file, they can start charging it without getting any approval. And if they come back and deny them, they can immediately refile. So you can see how it's literally like set up so that they can just charge whatever they want to. And so there's this trickle down effect, right? Which is like the administrative burden. Well, I guess let me back up and explain the exchange fees piece, right? Like every 
almost every stock exchange charges exchange fees in and of itself, which can be very expensive, like thousands and thousands of dollars a month. Smaller exchanges with less volume, therefore like higher drift from the NBBO or the you know true stock price, they don't charge exchange fees, right? Or some of them charge cheaper ones, whatever, like IEX doesn't have any for now. We'll see if they file and start doing it. Everyone does eventually, right? It's the number one way for an exchange to make money. But that trickles down and means that only if you can afford thousands and thousands of dollars a month are you getting the most accurate stock price. And how is that fair, right? So, and that's only one piece of it. That's the exchange fees piece. Then you get into, and, and maybe for individual retail traders, it doesn't matter, but for their apps that they're using and the app developers, if you're displaying that data, forget about like huge fees, right? Per user fees. Imagine like take Yahoo Finance and think of it as an app, right? 30 million monthly users. You have to track every single person who has eyeballs on that stock price and you get, pay, you get charged a per user fee. So you're a FinTech entrepreneur, right? You're building an app. That is a major administrative burden. Nobody, like we're innovating, we're moving, we're building, I'm building an app, like nobody has time for that. And so not only can you not afford that, but then the administrative burden of reporting all your users and are they a pro or a non-pro who's looking at the data? And it's just like an absolute nightmare, but it's this pyramid that's been built up and it's generating a lot of money for the exchanges, right? So, I mean, that's their business, right? That's how they make money, but there's a major gap in the market because you've got these free, open, zero restriction exchanges like IEX, but there's not enough volume for it really to be great stock price feed. And then you have the other extreme over here where it's like thousands and thousands of dollars in exchange fees and there's really nothing in the middle. And so at Entrinio, we're doing a lot of innovating in this space. Where we're kind of taking smaller exchanges that have a decent amount of volume and weaving them together into a stock price feed that has a floor of delayed data. So if a stock isn't trading at any point in time, it'll automatically revert to the, the most recent delayed data point and actually be pretty accurate. And so for people that are building apps and displaying this data, that can be a huge, huge benefit to them to not have to pay any of those fees. But if you don't pay the fees and if you don't follow the rules and if you don't pay the, oh my God, not only will the hammer come down on you, like huge regulatory risk, you also can get black marked in the industry. The exchanges all talk to each other and they might never make that data available to you again. And this has happened to us with clients before, and I won't name any names, but they'll come to us and they'll say, we want a streaming options feed to plug in, you know, options data, options trades, unusual options. We go call, you know, Oprah, we go call the exchanges to try to get them approval because we have it all integrated to plug into their app. And they're like, no, we won't work with these guys. And we're like, and then we can't make the sale. Right. And it's like, because they previously didn't pay the fees. And so it's like almost set up to make you fail in a weird way, right? Like nobody, like most people don't know the nuances of how the exchange works, exchanges work and all these fees, and they don't do a great job of marketing either, right? They're big companies who pretty much just sell institutional feeds or, you know, they, you know, work with people who are just co-locating at the exchange and doing like a super low latency solution. So it's a, it's a challenge, but our solution to it has just been education, right? Like, we help you fill out your exchange paperwork. We help you understand the rules. We've got videos. I mean, it's, I think education is really the only way right now until regulation changes to, to fix some of this. So. Yeah, trading yeah. is a really big uphill battle to begin with, you know? And then um, anything as far as creating a trading business and the data and everything. When I first got into this, most places had delayed data. Um, yeah. And yeah. one thing I'll touch on that's not even related to that was I didn't find much recognition for, for those who served and have served, you know, military mm -hmm. and veterans and stuff. And yeah. Yeah. I started reaching out to these companies. This is totally aside, but I started reaching out to all these companies. And I found that they all wanted to participate in this, but they didn't yeah. know how. They didn't know how to verify who's actually serving, who's maybe telling right. that, that they served and they didn't. But I, I, I'm, I'm really happy that I got to participate in that. When you get all this data, it can also come in a way that's hard to translate. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, two points. First of all, we have a military discounted in Trinio. So first of all, thank you for your service. And second of all, the funny piece of this is we at one point in time had a plan that was super cheap. And we had somebody sign up with a military discount, a student discount and a free trial and they ended up paying us like $2 a month or something. <laughs> it's like one of our funniest sales. I think we still have them on just like, because it's amazing. Um, but yeah, the, the data when it comes through is not clean usually. Um, and that's a lot of, this is actually kind of an important thing to talk about, right? We get a lot of people that say things like, well, but all this data is on Yahoo Finance or, but I can just go to stock exchange to get my own data. And like, 
no. <laughs> right? So first of all, and this is, again, most people just don't know what's happening in the underbelly of this world, right? Like Yahoo Finance pays over $10 million a year to Morningstar to integrate all of that data. And if you're pulling it down and using it, you're violating their terms of service, you're breaking the law, right? So we actually had Yahoo Finance's API shut down once because so many people were, we knew so many people were coming to us and saying, but we're just pulling it from Yahoo Finance. And it's like, that's illegal redistribution and violating their terms. And so it's not, it's not as simple as that, right? Like you can't just go get data points off the internet. Um, and then the second piece is if you go directly to the exchanges to, to your question, like take options, for example. Oh my God, the volume of data relative to equities feeds, right? I mean, the amount of options, like it's billions and billions of contracts, right? Like even just storing that data in a database is enough to put a small company out of business, much less an individual, right? So how are you going to connect? How many engineers do you have on your personal team to connect? How much money do you have saved to store it in AWS? And then it comes through unfiltered, right? So like options specifically, that data needs to be filtered. All the crap trades and stuff need to be pulled out. And we have algorithms that do that to make it a really clean um, feed. But I think it's, again, a lack of education, right? People just don't realize how much work goes on behind the scenes and what needs to be done to actually make the data usable. It's like a hundred step process, right? So um, yeah, it's it requires a lot of work on the back end to get that stuff ready to actually use. And then it, that's important, right? Like whether you're making a trade yourself or building an app so other people can trade, that data can't be wrong, <laughs> right? Like very, that's, very important. There's, there's, billions of dollars uh, behind it. And so having a support team and a data quality team and everything is is key. Yes. Yeah, so you I, I saw one video where you were saying that your fundamental data when it comes through sometimes looks like gibberish. And I mean, that was that's pretty interesting. And and I, I had talked to I, I believe I talked to Quad before Q U O yeah, yeah. D D, I think it yeah, is. Yeah. Uh, and, and they were telling me that, um, you know, it would probably be easy for me to get data through them at that point, but yeah. I would have to then have a program that can translate that data. Yeah, yeah, they're actually a partner of ours. So pretty soon you will be able to, to they're gonna be distributing our data too. Um, but yeah, so fundamental data, like this just illustrates how broken this whole industry is, right? All the 10Ks and 10Qs and financial statements up until 2009 were like, might as well have been like printed on paper, right? Like PDFs, like there was no, there, the data wasn't digitized and it wasn't structured. So there really was like, unless you hire an army of thousands of people to look at the data and manually plug it into a database, like you're not going to be able to really get access to it. And so um, there was this innovation that came out <clears throat> in 2009. Congress mandated that a lot of that like core basic data needed to be filed in a programming language called XBRL, um, which is just another version of XML. Um, it just looks like HTML, right? Essentially, like now instead of having a PDF, you can actually have you have tables of data and structured data that you can programmatically go get access to and pull down. So that was the first piece. It was like, okay, now the raw data, this is a good solution, right? We've solved the problem. We can go get the data, pull it down pretty easily. The problem was only just beginning because getting access to the data is one thing, but no two companies file their financial statements the same way, right? Oracle reports cloud computing revenues and hardware revenues and software revenues and consulting revenues. Apple's accountants just choose to say revenue because there's no rules, right? Like you can call it whatever you want. So the taxonomy for the names of the line items, revenue, operating revenue, expenses, it's over 300,000 items long. Our system has seen over 300,000 unique names for just the faces of the financial statements, right? But, and then you think about doing that on a global scale, right? Like, so it's another example of, yes, you can go to the SEC and get the data. Of course you can, it's open, it's free to, to investors. Is it actually usable, right? You won't even be able to compare revenue between two companies and an own company's revenue over time because the data is not standardized. And so that's another place that we focused on automating, again, with the goal, right, of like, let's not hire 10,000 people to do this. Let's use machine learning so that the costs get passed on to our end users and we make it more accessible to everybody. So uh, Born to be Free says, are the trades that are considered crap thrown out or are they still considered in the scope of the collection process? um we filter those out so they are like crap stuff is completely filtered out yes good question nice Martha. that that was probably very difficult to get to that point i'm sure <laughs> it's, it's tedious but we did it yep <laughs>
when we're looking at these the, the charts a lot of times sometimes right after hours or something you'll see a big spike you know it'll be right back down and we don't know like is that real did the chart did right, the price actually right. go there why did it do that and i think and new traders just really don't know a lot of this and i don't know i i had a i had my own problems with that as execution errors and then you know in my understanding what i'm actually reading i was a fool and i just started putting my money in i just you know, hey, let's just click click some buttons. This looks like fun, one way to right? learn. <laughs> I've always learned the hard way, and it, I think it works out pretty well for me. I I, I went from um, pretty much middle school. I didn't do anything in high school. I went in the front door, out the back door. The only class I think I went to was metal shop and wood shop, and I ended up doing push ups the whole hour. The only reason <laughs> I started to go to high school was because I was in wrestling, and I wanted to be part of that. You know, and then I went straight from that into. Um, I, I, I tested pretty good for a GD going in the military, came out, and then I tested for um, to get into a nice university, Lawrence Technological University. And I don't know when I when I went there, it was just um, I, I showed up in the classroom and didn't have a clue. I, I was starting from nothing because I didn't really go yeah. to school and I didn't really do any of this stuff. So I'm here. I'm yeah. going to school for mechanical engineering. I've had barely any community college at all. Last math class I had was in like eighth grade or something. And now here I am going in trying to do calculus, you know, and stuff right. like that soon. I did do the, the, like I said, the community college algebra, but the point is, is that I was thrown into this and I caught up pretty well. Like these yeah, kids, yeah. these kids had when, you know, they were like top of their class and here they are. And I'm like, not even a class and I'm coming in there and I caught up my first trigonometry class. I got over a hundred percent. I'm just, I was just amazed. It's like, how am I doing nice. well at something that I never even showed up to, but it, it yeah. I don't know. That's the point is, is that it's, it's, if we just apply ourselves and don't know, yeah, yeah. We don't know what's going on, just get in there and try and fail. I failed right, a lot right. in trading. But also it's a good example of just like how screwed the higher education system is, right? And that's actually one thing that I love about the trader community is like just the self direction and the self learning. Like this is not the kind of thing that you can go to school to learn how to do, right? Like the to your point, the community, the online courses, the apps, the tools, you know, communities like yours, like that's where you can really learn to be good at this. And it's the same way I think about like how I hire engineers. I won't hire engineers. Usually I won't hire engineers that, that have a computer science degree because in a, in a startup or a tech focused company, right? Like you don't want people thinking inside of a box and what does school do, right? Like what real world applications are there in school? You're learning out of a textbook. You learn this rubric for how life works and it's not how life fucking works. Right. And so people that kind of shunned that and are willing to kind of just use the internet, which is a wealth of information, it proves that like they don't think of learning as something that's ever done, right? They're gonna stay on top of the best practices in coding and they're gonna stay on top of the best trading tips and tools. Like that mentality to me is far more attractive than somebody who just went to school and got a degree. Right. So I don't know if there's a lot of people out there like me that think like that, but I, I hope there are more. When I started in trading, I, I didn't know what I was doing. Actually, my first stock that I ever thought I owned, my grandpa had given me a paper certificate. I went into a bank and I'm like, how do I sell this thing? And they're like, sir, I don't know how you sell that thing. We don't even know. We don't deal in that. We're in yeah. the, you know, the digital age. And um, from from there, I, when I, I don't know, I just, it, it was a big, long uphill battle. And yeah. as far as with you over there, uh, with, with what you guys are doing, for me, I tell people that if you get rid of, I have to get rid of all my bad habits. That's what I'm trying to get to. I have to get rid yeah. of all my bad habits. If I want to be a successful trader, every single thing that I'm doing wrong in my life, everything I'm not doing that I'm supposed to be doing, it the trading is a, is a reflection right back at me. It shows, yeah. Yeah. It, it's going to show in my trading no matter what. So if I if I smoke, I, I should probably quit smoking. If I'm eating sugary snacks, which I did start doing again, which is very bad, don't ever do that. <laughs> uh, it, it shows up in my trading. It, no matter what it is, if I'm sick, if I'm feeling, you know, yeah. how does that translate to what you're doing and, and how do you stay ahead of it? So I wrote this article for Forbes um, called The Work-Life Balance Fallacy, A Case for Cycles. And I don't think that humans are meant to be in this perfect state of equilibrium all the time, right? Like you'll fucking lose your mind if you're not having a sugary snack once in a while, right? Like, let's be honest. And and like, if you look at, if you like study history, right? Like humans go through cycles, the freaking moon, right? Like, like it, that's how humans behave. And so for us to try to force ourselves into being in that state all of the time, I think is extremely unhealthy and literally not how humans are built. 
So learning to ride the waves and the cycles to me has been an art, right? Like if I'm fundraising for Intrinio, it's 150% of my time. I am not in balance. I am not going to the gym. I'm not calling my mom. Sorry, mom, right? Like, it, but you have to learn when to flip the cycle down. And then I just fuck off for four days and don't even like look at my phone, right? So like, th that's to me what I think is the real way that things get done. And, and there's caveats all around this, right? Because like, to me, great things don't happen in times of balance. Like we didn't land on the moon. Those guys weren't making it home for dinner with their wives is an, is an example I use all the time, right? So if you are really focused on something, it's okay for you to like to not be perfect in every other area of your life, right? Like, and and letting go of that like thing we do to ourselves where we're like, oh, you're failing, you're bad, you didn't make your bed this morning, like whatever. It's okay, fuck it, right? Like you're in the zone right now. You're working on something big, but but finding that like the caveat is that you can't like die, right? Like you can't eat so many sugary snacks and like never go to the gym. Like there's caveats around that, and then also like knowing when the cycle should go up and down also right like and, and also it's like a sine wave right it could be stretched like how long are your cycles like at what point do you need to, to shut it down and take a break and get back into a routine and get back into balance so it's a bit of a far out perspective but in practice that's actually what i think works and how most people are, are naturally meant to behave See, with with me i i locked myself into a little room every single night um you know i would have a drink and just turn on some youtube videos i would listen to audiobooks read books whatever it was and just kept going and then every single thing was the same thing i told you like with going to school i didn't know what i was doing with building a website i probably yeah, still yeah. don't have the nicest website out there but it's it was it was it fun for me work. to learn and i was going nonstop. everything was just amazing you know no days off mentality and then i I have three, like three hernias literally at the same time. And I ended up getting, I believe what was COVID and it amplified all my pain in my body. So at that point, it like hit me psychologically in a way that I said, you know what, for my mental health, I have to back up, calm down, yeah. and just not even worry about this right now. I couldn't worry about right. public and, and just continuing yeah. any of that. So I had people calling me, Andy, do you want to do this? We have this event and whatever. I'm like, you know, I, I, my, my whole thing was never say no. You know, I, mm -hmm. you touched on that before too, but I, you know, never say no, just, just go out and do it. And I, it got yeah. to a point where I was like, nope, I can't go do it. I have to back off. I have to just live for myself for a bit since yeah, I've been yeah. getting down here. It's the opposite. Now I'm like on the beach or trails or something every single day. And I maybe need to push myself back into the other area of life, but right. Balance, yeah. right. Balance in the cycles. <laughs> Balance and cycles. Exactly. Um, so it, as far as the retail community goes, if we're looking for anything that you guys have to offer, mm -hmm. what exactly would you say in the simplest way that we should be thinking about in, in relation so, to Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and I do not mean to like generalize you guys, right? But in, in my mind, the way I think about this is there's kind of two categories of traders, right? There are traders who are super technical and know what an API is and are building their own models and are pulling in raw data. And that's like a very specific type of like quant oriented or, or technical trader. And there's traders who aren't programmers, but they're really good traders and they need the apps and they need the tools, right? So in that bucket, right? Like it's tough because our product is an API. We're very much a white labeled backend infrastructure API delivery of data company. And we obviously sell a lot of data to people who build apps, but we also sell data to quants and invent like you know higher net worth investors who just pull in the data and plug it into their models or their own dashboards or doing their own stuff um so we do that a lot right and so we have a bronze plan which is super affordable um especially relative to a lot of the other providers out there um and it's a little bit whittled down you know but it's it's got everything that you would need if you're doing equities or options um we're going to be releasing etfs and uh earnings estimates and a few other interesting data sets to the extent that that helps with your, your trades and your analysis. Um, but right. If you're, if you're technical, come try out a bronze plan, right? Like we'll give you free trial. We'll let you pull down the data. You know um, if you're not technical, I would encourage you just to like follow us on YouTube and look at our website because we're a channel into some of the, the cool apps, like our customers, right? Like just staying on top of like our podcast and our YouTube videos and our case studies and our website, you'll discover like some of these companies that are buying data from us are building like, <laughs> insane tools like unlocking like ai insights and all kinds of really cool interfaces for traders that like 
we get to see these apps before anybody else does at Intronio because like they're early and they're building. So like you guys could be some of the first to be using these tools, which is really cool. There's like nowhere else. Like think about when you're building an app, like the data provider is the first person to see what they're building, right? Because they, they have to integrate the data before they even go out to market. And so you can kind of get a really cool look into what's, what's happening in the app space out there and different tools for you just by looking at our customer base if you're not technical. So I would, uh, I would say those are the, probably the two easiest ways to check us out. And you have equities data, options data, futures as well? We have a partner that has futures data, so we can absolutely set people up with packages for that too. Okay. That's pretty cool. I mean, I, 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 I like the whole idea that, that anybody can come into this like I did and, you know, you can learn, like you said, API data and everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, before long, you're creating your own, I, I see, I see many people creating discord bots and just creating their own apps or, you know, mm -hmm. widgets programs on their websites. And it's, it's, it's really cool. It's a whole other area that we provide value to each other. And that's what I'm all about is just providing value, whatever we can do to help the community. So bring yep, it full circle absolutely. back to that. And yeah, I mean, basically that's that's all I really had for you today. And I'm really cool. happy that you came on with us today. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I, I just love your attitude. I love I love that you're you're kicking butt and you're out there, you know, pushing yourself. I, yeah. I'm a little crazy instead of just going out there and repelling, which I did and that was really fun in the military, but yeah. I um I owned a bunch of venomous snakes at a certain point and like I, I like to get myself too close to danger, I think. Yeah. I, I had to get rid of my fast cars and motorcycle because I was getting too crazy with that too. But it's, like yeah. you said, cycles. Sometimes it's push and sometimes yeah. it's pull back. Go fast, don't die, right? <laughs> I had a Harley and I had a problem where I was starting to drift around the corners and I couldn't help, I couldn't control myself. I was just getting too excited to get out there and nice. have too much fun. And That's then, next on my list. I signed up for motorcycle class. I just haven't taken it yet. So that'll, that'll be my next thing. <laughs> Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> the drivers here though, be careful if you're in Florida. Wow. Yeah. I've never Not seen bad. so many accidents. I've, I've never seen so many, we, we seen the news, like another death on, on one or something, you know, it's like yeah. insane. Yeah. I it, um, just live life to the fullest and push it and exercise, live healthy. But like you said, balance and, yeah. and just get out there and try it. Absolutely. But thanks so much for joining us and uh, we'll put any of your links in the description. I'm super happy that you came on here with us today. Yeah, this is fun. Thanks for having me. Have a good day, Rachel. Have a good day, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Order Phil, check us out. I know what time it is. This is the Mighty Soldiers exclusive. Yeah. yeah. Let's get it. Let's get it. Yeah. If you wanna take it to the streets, let's get it. If you wanna take it to the booth, let's get it. I'm about to take it to the top, let's get it. We ain't never ever gonna stop, let's get it. You ain't never heard nobody spit like this. Call the paramedics when I get like this. Front page news when I wreck like this. Hop in the booth and I wreck that shit like, oh. Uh. If you with the squad, then you already know what's up. It be going down, but my account is going up. I'm about to make another hundred thousand bucks. Uh. Rolling up that chain, I'm about to take another puff. Uh. Hold up. I made a killing, now my pockets got swollen. Independent, now I'm taking over. I'm a lot richer, you a lot broker. I'm a pot smoker, stockbroker, blowing up like a supernova. On my mama, I was born a soldier. The best in the game, man, I thought I told you. If you wanna take it to the streets, let's get it. If you wanna take it to the booth, let's get it. I'm about to take it to the top, let's get it. We ain't never ever gonna stop, let's get it. You ain't never heard nobody spit like this. Call the paramedics when I get like this. Front page dudes when I wreck like this. Hop in the booth and I wreck that shit like, oh. I am unstoppable, I can do anything I ever wanted to. Never did anything. Anything they ever wanted me to Got on my side and I'm not gonna lose And they're not gonna win I see them the haters It's all because I'm getting dollars again Commas on commas on commas I'm buying the dip The market is dropping again I can see them hating from the sidelines If you see a hater, tell them bye-bye Watch my money grow, grow, grow And my wife feel like, whoa, 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 whoa. Somebody better stop me cause there ain't no competition And I'm coming for the top position Obliterating the opposition Every time that I jot it in the composition Everybody wanna stop and listen Cause I bring it to you hotter than the oven in your mama kitchen I'll be getting hit like a politician I'ma get bread when you stack like it's all it is Scotty Pippen Ain't nobody ready for the I'ma get it when I pop the clip and I ain't playing I'm spraying you brain I'm bringing the pain like Damon Wayne You disappear like David Blaine I'm dropping bombs to Dom Hussein Stop and aim Pop you lames and pop champagne I ain't playing so stop the games You know the name if you wanna take it to the streets, let's get it. If you wanna take it to the booth, let's get it. I'm about to take it to the top, let's get it. We ain't never ever gonna stop, let's get it. You ain't never heard nobody spit like this. Call the paramedics when I get like this. Front page dudes when I wreck like this.
like this Hop in the booth and I wreck that shit like, uh